Hello, everyone. Welcome to the annual District 6 crime meeting. Last month, I did an informal survey and requested that people let me know their three most important issues. The top issue was public safety, specifically crime. So in response to your concerns, I requested that the Berkeley Police Department join me tonight with the goal of sharing with you some current data and answering the questions you may have about crime in our community and what's being done about it. Your safety has always been my top concern. My hope is that this program tonight will provide useful information that can help to keep you and your loved ones safe. I wanna take this opportunity to thank my legislative aide, Lori McWhorter, and also to thank Interim Chief of Police, Jen Lewis, for her collaboration on tonight's program. Joining us tonight are Lieutenant Matt McGee, Sergeant Kevin Kleppe, and Arlo Malmerg, strategic analyst. Now for a little housekeeping. Sorry. First, we're going to hear a presentation from our police department. If you have questions, you can use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. After the presentation is over, we will recognize attendees who has, have raised their hands in order and you can ask your question. Please keep your question brief if you have a comment rather than a question, please hold it for the end of the program. Our intent is to answer as many questions as possible in our very short time together tonight. Each question will be repeated so that all attendees will be able to hear it. For your information, there are more than 200 people in attendance tonight, and we're gonna to try to get to as many questions as possible. If your question is not dealt with tonight, please feel free to send me the question at my email and I will route the question appropriately for the police department to respond. For your information, we are recording the program tonight so that people who were not able to attend will be able to view it in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. And now I will hand it over to Lieutenant McGee. Thank you very much, Council Member. My name is Lieutenant Matt McGee. I'm currently assigned to our Community Services Bureau here, here at the Berkeley Police Department. With me tonight is Sergeant Kevin Kleppe and our strategic analyst, Arlo Malmberg. A little bit about myself, and I'll then pass it over to Sergeant Kleppe and Arlo Malmberg to introduce themselves prior to us getting started. I've been at the Berkeley Police Department for 15 years. I first started working patrol after patrol, I went to our detective division where I investigated crimes against youth. I was part of our youth services unit. After that, I became our school resource officer and was stationed at Berkeley High School for approximately five years. From there, I was promoted to sergeant and ran our youth services unit. After that, I was promoted to lieutenant and have been assigned to the Community Services Bureau since then. Prior to coming to the Berkeley Police Department, I worked in probation and worked in juvenile halls. I also worked in nonprofits and received my master's in social work from the University of California, Berkeley. That's a little bit about who I am and what I bring to this position and to this police department. I'll hand it over to Sergeant Kevin Kleppe to introduce himself now. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Kleppe. I'm a police sergeant assigned to the Community Services Bureau. Uh, I've been with the department for over 12 years. Uh, during that time, I served and worked in patrol. Uh, I worked in the drug task force for three years, came back to patrol, became a field training officer. I'm also a member of our uh, firearms and tactics unit and an active shooter instructor. Uh, I've been on our special response team for over 10 years. Uh, I was promoted to sergeant in 2020. Uh, I worked as a patrol sergeant for two years. And since I believe August of last year, I've been the supervisor of the sergeant in the Community Services Bureau. 
and I will pass it over to Arlo. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I am a, a data and policy analyst with the department. I work closely with Matt and Kevin, um, and I uh, look at the, the data that the department collects and receives and help make uh, policy recommendations based on that, that data. Um, I first started working with the department as a graduate student at UC Berkeley's uh, Goldman School of Public Policy, um, where I helped look at some of the numbers around racial disparities as part of the Fair and Impartial uh, Policing Task Force. Um, from there, I spent a couple of years working at UC Berkeley's Division of Data Science, um, organizing and, and facilitating data science projects for social sector organizations. Um, and I was uh, really excited to come back and work full time with the department last year and um, dig deep into the data for uh, the department and also for um, community uh, meetings like this. All right, thank you, Arlo. And for better understanding, I supervise both Kevin and Arlo. Arlo is part of a three person team, which includes an officer and another analyst that make up our strategic analysis team. Uh, the purpose of this meeting tonight is to focus on crime that has occurred in District 6 and look at a little bit of the crime data related to District 6 um, and have a communication or a conversation with the community about the crime. Uh, next slide, please, Arlo. So we will go over BPD's role uh, from the response to the investigation of crime. Uh, we'll talk about general crime trends. Uh, we will then get into problem specific stats for uh, District 6. We'll talk about Berkeley PD's response to the crime and then uh, give some community resources. Next slide, please. So we want to start here. Uh, this is a flow chart that is a very broad and general overview of all the different events that can occur within the criminal justice system, of which there are pieces that obviously BPD is involved. As you can see on the very left of this flow chart, that's primarily where we as a police department will interact with that crime. Uh, the purpose of this is not to read through every uh, step of this flow chart, it's to just give you an idea of the complexity involved in the system. All of these pieces affect how the community, you, experience crime. And like I said, we will focus on just a small piece of this, which is essentially the emergency response, the investigation, and those proactive steps that we take to prevent and investigate crime. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to Sergeant Kleppe to talk about that initial response. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so what I'm going to talk through is the patrol response to a call, a call for service or a crime report. Uh, so to kind of get into the base, uh, so Berkeley PD, we have seven patrol teams that work 24-7, 365. Uh, and they are going to be the ones primarily responding to a call for service. So what is a call for service? So if somebody sees something happening, they see a crime occurring, they think they see a crime occurring, they make a phone call to us. A dispatcher will take that call. They will get as much information as they can. And what they will do is they will categorize the call and they will prioritize a call. So when I say prioritize, that will be if it's an immediate life safety issue versus like a cold report, which occurred yesterday or an hour ago. So once that uh, call for service is created, uh, an officer is dispatched and their primary res responsibility is to respond and determine if a crime has occurred, and if so, what kind of crime has occurred. Based on that information, uh, if a crime has occurred, then they will do their due diligence to locate the suspect suspects and attempt to take them into custody. And if that is not the case, then their primary job is to conduct a preliminary investigation. So part of that investigation involves locating and identifying evidence such as you know blood evidence, DNA, tools left on the scene. Uh, they also look for additional witnesses. They look for cameras. They look for anything that will give them additional leads. And just a real quick kind of point, you'll hear us talk about calls for service and crime reports. So the call for service talks about what type of call it is initially classified as. 
then an officer will arrive on scene. And once they determine if a crime has occurred, a crime report will be generated. And sometimes it's different than the actual call type that's entered in. So uh, in the case of no arrest, what happens is once that officer collects all that additional information, they prepare that crime report and it gets forwarded up to the appropriate investigations division. So for example, if it's a robbery, it will get forwarded to the robbery detective bureau. In the case of an arrest, there are a couple different outcomes. Uh, they can, based on the crime, they can cite and release the uh, arrested party and that'll happen in the field. So there's no booking person will be issued a citation for the appropriate crime committed and they will be released uh, with a court date in the future. There's also the option of we take custodial uh, or we take custody of the arrested party, we transport them to the Berkeley Police Department jail. Once they're booked into the jail, they are then several hours later issued a citation and released. There's also the uh, outcome where a suspect or an arrested party is booked and they are held until their arraignment. That typically only happens with more serious crimes. And during this process, there's also opportunities where if it's appropriate, the people we take into custody uh, are placed on a involuntary psychiatric hold. So what that does is that pauses all the criminal proceedings until they are cleared from the hospital, whether it's a regular hospital or a psych specific hospital, um, once they are cleared, we pick them up, we will transport them back to jail, and then the criminal proceedings continue. So that is the patrol response for a call for service or a crime report. I'm going to turn it over to the lieutenant for a little more information on the investigations portion. Thank you, Kevin. So the detective division will receive the report from patrol. I'll quickly run through our detective division as it stands today. We have a homicide unit which is one sergeant and two detectives, a robbery unit, which is one sergeant and two detectives, a sex crimes unit, which is one sergeant, two sex crimes detectives, and one domestic violence detective. We have a youth services unit, which is one sergeant, three detectives, and our school resource officer. And then we have our property crimes, which is one sergeant and three detectives. The respective detective unit will follow up on the case from patrol, and which, which may include some or all of the following, interviewing the witnesses or reviewing re-interviewing witnesses, the victims, and possibly the suspects. The evidence collection, as Sergeant Kleppe mentioned, uh, the evidence collection that was not able to be completed uh, by the patrol officers, such as canvassing for additional video uh, or the processing of evidence that was collected by the patrol officers. Uh, our detectives will also write search warrants. There's a multitude of search warrants uh, that potentially need to be written in a great number of cases. Uh, and that takes up a great amount of the detective's time. He's actually going through and preparing those search warrants to get approved by judges over at the county. Uh, and if we are successful and we can identify a suspect, we will then prepare and seek and uh, complete the arrest warrants and then actually serve those arrest warrants. So upon completion of the case, the case is, then, is prepared and then brought over to the district attorney's office for review and possible charging. So with that, I will hand it over to Arlo to uh, talk about the data related to District 6. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I think that's really great context as we, as we turn to the numbers here. Um, now, I, I just want to say that I'm going to show a, a number of charts and graphs, and I'll try to highlight the main points uh, as I see them um, as we move through the slides. But if you want to spend uh, more time with this data, everything I'm going to show you is available on the Transparency Hub. So if I move too fast off of a graph or, or something you find interesting, uh, I'm happy to go back and spend more time in it, um, but also know that you can find the same information and much more uh, at your leisure on the Transparency Hub. Okay, so let's dive uh, first into the, the calls for service and then the uh, crime reports that were written in the, the five years between 2018 through 2022. 
And for both of those data sets, we'll take a broad look at the city and then zoom in to the numbers for District 6. So for all of the calls for service numbers that we're going to see, uh, we are excluding officer initiated calls. Uh, so these are all calls that came into the department, uh, for example, through 911, the non-emergency number or online. Um, and here, we are looking at the monthly calls for service numbers for the whole city. Uh, you can see there was a, a pretty persistent decline below historical levels starting in uh, 2020. Uh, more recently, call volume has climbed closer to the five-year average, uh, but we haven't fully returned to the pre-2020 equilibrium. And, it, and it's unclear if we will uh, when it comes to the calls for service uh, citywide. Here, uh, we're seeing the same numbers, but zoomed in on District 6. So non-officer initiated calls for service uh, from the past five years. The, the pre and post 2020 average call volumes look uh, pretty similar citywide uh, to, the, to the citywide numbers, um, but the drop in call volume in 2020 wasn't as steep. Um, one difference between the, the citywide numbers and the calls for service in District 6 is that the calls coming from District 6 have a lower proportion of calls labeled as priority ones or twos, uh, which as Kevin mentioned, are, are VPD's most urgent and, and serious calls. Um, in the previous slide, we saw that citywide 47% uh, of calls come in as a level one or two, while only 34% of calls from District 6 get labeled as level uh, one or two. So uh, taking one more step into the calls for service data, uh, we're looking at the, the top 10 call types for the whole city on the left and for just District 6 on the right. Um, calls regarding an audible alarm have been almost twice as prevalent in District 6 than in, any other, uh, than in the other districts, um, though that is certainly a, a frequent call type at, at the city level. Um, in District 6, most of those audible alarm calls are for residences uh, as opposed to uh, commercial locations. Okay, so focusing in on, on just 2022, we see that calls regarding grand thefts have become much more common in District 6, uh, both in number and in relation to, to other call types. Um, and this is a preview of, of where we're headed, but Grand theft is a call type that is often assigned to catalytic converter theft calls. Uh, and as you know, this is something we've seen a, a boom in. So let, let's dig into the, to the crime data. Again, uh, we'll look at the whole city compared to just District 6 on a couple of measures. Um, here, we're looking at, at all crime reports. Uh, we see a similar drop in 2020, like we saw with the calls for service numbers. Um, but then we see a much steadier rebound to the five-year average and, uh, and a bit beyond. And in District 6, uh, we see a steadier trend in the long term. Uh, th that is, we don't see such a pronounced dip in 2020, um, though there is quite a bit of variance from month to month. Uh, so, so the natural next question here is what uh, types of crimes are occurring or or what is the composition of crime types of these, these crime reports? Over the five-year period we're looking at, um, auto burglaries and misdemeanor thefts have been quite common both in District 6 and in the city at large. Uh, the two crime types that are uh, particularly overrepresented in District 6 uh, are fraud, forgery, and identity theft. In 2022 specifically, uh, felony thefts, uh, along with thefts from autos, have become uh, prominent crime types both at the city level, uh, but especially in District 6. Um, catalytic converter thefts are almost always classified as one of those two crime types. So here are the numbers for completed catalytic converter thefts. And of course, if we count uh, attempted thefts, these numbers would go up a bit. Um, the increase in catalytic converted thefts in District 6 from 2021 to 2022 is actually greater than the overall increase in crime reports. 
So the scale of, uh, of both the volume and the rate of change of catalytic converted thefts is really significant in District 6. Uh, the one thing to note is that District 6 contains about one eighth of the population of Berkeley and experiences about one tenth of all catalytic converted thefts. Okay, so uh, quickly, two more crime types of note. Um, shootings are steadily rising at the city level, but continue to be rare in District 6. Um, of course, gun violence is of great concern to, to everyone and can affect our, our sense of safety. And finally, taking a look at robberies. Uh, citywide, there was a March decrease in 2020 uh, that has yet to return to pre-2020 uh, levels. And that pattern holds for District 6, where already uh, robberies were relatively rare and continue to be uh, after a, a drop in 2020. So hopefully this was an interesting uh, run through the numbers and you were able to place some trends that District 6 is facing in context with what's going on in the rest of the city. And uh, again, all of this data lives on the Transparency Hub and I'm happy to take folks through how to use the hub during uh, Q&A if, if that's of interest. Okay, uh, so to, to wrap up, I'll turn it back over to Matt and Kevin to talk a bit about how we are responding to these crime trends. All right, thank you, Arla. So how can we respond? We wanna have a communication, a working together. It's a collaborative relationship of what happens in the community and how we can respond here at the PD. But the big piece of that is we need to know what happens out in the community. So for the next step, next slide, please, Arlo. So responding to calls for service, we don't know what we don't know. So please give us a call. Even if you think it's something that is uh, not important or a cold situation, nothing happening at the current moment, please give us a call. We will take those cases. We will mark those data points. As you just saw, we are collecting the data. We're looking at the data. And when it comes to a crime, you never know what sort of information you may give to us that actually might be a break in a case. So please, we will respond to the calls for service, but also please give us a call. We've had a number of community meetings where we are told about crimes that are occurring in certain locations that we just didn't know about. So please give us a call. Um, to that point, we will investigate. Uh, if there's a crime that has occurred, we will investigate that crime. Uh, either from the patrol level, like we reviewed earlier, or bring it to the investigation and detective level if it, if it is so called for. Um, additionally, interagency information sharing. Um, part of the detective division and part of patrol is sharing the information beyond just our borders. We understand that a number of crimes, one of the crimes that Arlo just mentioned, catalytic converters, is beyond just the borders of Berkeley. It is a regional, it is a state, it is a national issue um, that we are not gonna solve solely by ourselves here at Berkeley PD. Uh, we need your help from the community to call us when you see something, we will respond, we will follow up on the leads, we'll pursue cases that we can, and we are gonna share information with other agencies that are beyond our Berkeley borders. But in addition to interagency information sharing, we're also sharing for some crimes that are occurring within our city, we're gonna reach out to our partners uh, at other city departments and be collaborative in our approach uh, for the most accurate and proper intervention. Um, if it is an alternative response that is not law enforcement led, then we will look for that. Uh, we regularly, we uh, being my team here in the Community Services Bureau, we regularly communicate with other city partners to work with those who are possibly experiencing uh, an unhoused situation in their lives. And we try to find the most appropriate response for the situation that is presented to us. If it is going to be a law enforcement response, we will do that. However, if there is another response that is potentially more appropriate, we will do that as well. Uh, and then information-based policing. So what you just saw uh, from Arlo is, is the data. Uh, we're looking at the data. We're making a concerted effort. Um, 
Internally, we have internal data tools that every patrol officer, every detective has access to. We are encouraging the use of those tools on a regular basis so that the officers are aware of what's going on in their area of coverage in their beat area or in the beats next to them. Uh, the idea is that the information that we receive, the data that we receive from you in the community can be digested uh, in an efficient manner by patrol officers and they can act upon that uh, to lead to information-based policing, whether it's gonna be for vehicle stops, pedestrian stops, or to just provide the alternative response, which I previously mentioned. So it gets back to what I first talked about, which is our response to calls for service. We need to know what's happening out there so we can provide the most efficient, effective response that we can. And then finally, community outreach. Um, that's what this is right here. That's the primary purpose of our transparency hub is to give the data that had previously been uh, there but in, in not such an easy manner to interact with. Uh, it's now there for you to interact with, for you to check out and see and, and manipulate and work with at your own leisure. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be just at a community presentation like this. You can actually go on the site anytime. Uh, it's updated on a regular basis. Uh, and it's something that we hope to build upon and when I say build upon, we want to increase the communication between us and the community. Uh, hopefully we'll soon be able to, uh, you know, or we are working on some additional tools to add to the Transparency Hub where we can increase that communication with the community and have a better uh, collaborative relationship uh, between the police department and the community. Um, part of the community outreach, uh, Kevin will talk about next, but in addition to the Transparency Hub, it's our other avenues uh, and other platforms in which we get our message out there, whether it be via social media, Nixel, or press releases. Um, I will turn it over to uh, Sergeant Kleppe to take you through uh, what the community can help us out with. Thanks, Lieutenant. Um, and I know we kind of, we hit this already, but it's on there twice because it's it's really important to us. And I say that um, when we talk about reporting crimes, if we are going to have the accurate data to appropriately prioritize responses for crimes, we need to know when they're occurring, where they're occurring, the manner in which they're occurring, vehicles involved, people involved, all of that is critical information that we need to have. And then when we go to track neighborhood trends, so that ties in with reporting crimes, but it's also a, you know, it's a neighborhood response. So if you are aware of something going on, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. The more people that have eyes looking out for these things and know about these things, the better response we're going to be able to have because things are reported promptly. They, you know, if you know what to look for, based off of these trends and you see something, there's no, there shouldn't be a question in your mind, like maybe I will, maybe I won't call on this. Um, yeah, it just, it gives a better perspective. So in the Community Services Bureau, uh, what we do is we provide what's called Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, SEPTED. What that is, it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, about crime prevention. So there's actually a link in the Transparency Hub where there's an interactive video where you can get a sense of what SEPTED is, and then you can request a SEPTED trained officer to come out to your house, to your business, to an apartment building that you live in or that somebody manages. Uh, it's a very, it's a collaborative approach between the police and the community to try to minimize the opportunity for crimes to occur, to um, reduce victimization, um, so that's something that we're really, really trying to get more involved in, and we want more people to ask for it um, to provide that information. Uh, we also have a camera registry. So all of this is, is letting the police department know who you are, where you live, and that you have a camera. We don't have access to any part of your camera system. It just lets us know where these cameras are. And this is important because it allows us to be more efficient in our response and in our investigation. Um, if during the course of investigation, 
we want to look for video, right? We want to see surveillance video. We want to capture as much data and information uh, to try to locate the suspects and apprehend them. So this is a lot more efficient rather than us going up and down each block, knocking on every door, asking every single person, hey, do you have video surveillance? Yes, I do. No, I don't. This is just a little bit more efficient for us. And lastly, we also provide crime-specific prevention. So on, our, on the Transparency Hub, there's a video about catalytic converted thefts and what you can do to hopefully minimize the chance that it occurs. Uh, we also put out uh, you know, public safety statements if we see crime trends that are occurring. Also with the information of how to try to prevent victimization um, during the course of, you know, as you go about your day. So that wraps up the community response. Uh, next, we're going to go to Q and A. Council member. You're, you're muted, council member. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm sure that uh, many in the audience have lots of questions and I want to kick it off um, with one question. What is the um, URL for the Transparency Hub? I think, you know, we've made, we've referenced it several times tonight, but I'm not sure people know how to get there. Yeah, great, great question. Um, the URL is a little unwieldy, um, and I'm happy to read it off. The, the easiest thing to do is to Google or, or search uh, Berkeley PD Transparency Hub. Um, but for those who are interested, the the exact the direct URL is bpd transparency transparency initiative berkeleypd.hub.arcgis.com. So. Okay. Google, oh, Google is directly transparent. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So I am, we'll go to questions now. Um, if you have a question, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the outline of a hand. If you click on that, then we can see who has raised hands and we will call on you in order. Lori, uh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. To Take, remind. It Take it away. Okay. I want to remind people that we're taking uh, questions verbally only. So if you typed a question into the Q&A, please raise your hand so that we can call on you to ask your question. All right. The first person, uh, the first question is going to come from Sagar Jaitani. And allow you to talk. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, you know, it's interesting. Interim Chief Jen Lewis reported this month that violent and property crime was at a 10 year high in Berkeley. And while I certainly appreciate all the care that went into the presentation today and the data, especially, I got to say, it doesn't really comport with my experience as a Cal parent whose kids are living at Berkeley. As you guys know, 10 days ago, a group of Cal students was robbed at gunpoint on 4th Street. And just yesterday, a Cal student was robbed at gunpoint in broad daylight, in the middle of the morning in a CVS parking lot. My feeling is that the situation is out of control and that if no meaningful action is taken to change things, it ends only one way with one of our kids losing their life. Now look, Responding to calls for service is obviously hugely important, and I'm glad that you focused on that, but I would like to know a little bit more about what you're doing for crime prevention. Like, do you have the right amount of staffing? If I'm not mistaken, I think that you have around 120 active duty officers today at BPD, but that I think you're authorized for maybe up to 180. I'd like to know about that. Um, the role of technology, you know, should we have more license plate scanners or more intersection cameras? in some of these high crime areas. I know there was a couple of questions in there, so uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. And thank you again so much for meeting with us. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, who would like to take it? Yeah, I'll take that question. Yeah, thank you very much for the question and thanks for being in attendance here tonight. Um, I, there were a couple of questions in there. Um, 
I will say that in regards to our staffing, you're, you're pretty much uh, right there. You're accurate. Uh, we are authorized for 181. We are currently at about 120. Um, our staffing is an issue. It's something that we're trying to combat. We have uh, an ancillary assignments for officers to work on a recruiting team. Uh, we have hiring incentives. Um, it's a challenging time. Uh, it's a challenging time to get officers uh, anywhere in the Bay Area, uh, in particular here. Um, there's uh, supply and demand, and uh, each local agency is doing what they can to hire officers. So we're competing with the other agencies around us uh, to, to get officers to, to come here either as laterals or as uh, brand new officers and train them up. Um, those crimes that you mentioned, absolutely, they are occurring. Uh, we are doing what we can uh, to investigate those crimes. Uh, what the other piece that we talked about are priority calls. Uh, we are absolutely responding to those priority calls. Uh, there are other calls that you may have to be uh, to wait uh, for a response because we are getting to priority calls. Uh, in fact, right now, now I'm at the station right now and I just heard sirens going. Uh, uh, and it looked like there was a priority call or it sounded like there was a priority call happening right now. So uh, we are responding to those priority calls and those calls that are not priority, you may have to wait a little bit longer because our staffing is tight right now, definitely. Um, hopefully that answered a number of the questions uh, that were posed right there. Okay, thank you. Lori? The next uh, question will come from Buddy Hoffman. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, get, I guess the previous qu uh, person asked about preventing crime. Um, it seems like the situation is very reactive and I don't know what to do to prevent crime either. Um, I'm concerned about, um, you know, if the local media is to be believed that uh, the actions of a district attorney might be thwarting the, you know, the results of the police department, you know, like if, if you arrest people and they're not prosecuted, I'm wondering what that does to the whole system and also the motivation to even arrest people. So I guess I'll, I, I have a lot of questions, but I'll leave it at that. I guess another question was, are you using Clearview to identify people by their faces? So those are my questions. Thank you. I appreciate the question. Uh... I'll start with the, the, the last piece of that first. We are not using Clearview. We do not have facial recognition software uh, in the city. Um, in terms of the district attorney, uh, that was kind of the purpose of showing that slide earlier is to um, kind of put out there how the system works. Uh, obviously, we do what we can at the, at the front end, uh, at that front line, and we prepare the cases and we send them to district attorney. Uh, our job is to prepare the best cases that we can, um, the most thorough and accurate factual cases that we can and present them to the district attorney. That's where we're at. That's what our focus is. Our officers are out there every day doing that uh, 24 seven. Our detectives are working around the clock, uh, short staffed, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, I think at a previous uh, community engagement event, we spoke with the property crime detectives uh, prior to getting on that event, that was that a uh, discussion was purely focused on catalytic converters, uh, and we have one detective that in 2022 had about 4,000 cases assigned to him, uh, and that was within our property crimes, like I mentioned. So uh, we're we're doing what we can. Uh, we're prioritizing, and we're trying to work as efficiently as possible. Um, I think the previous question was in regards to technology. We're always you know, looking for technology to help us. Uh, and if there is something, we're gonna bring it, uh, you know, before the council, we're gonna have discussions uh, to see if there is, if there are pieces of technology that can be helpful to us. Uh, because as you mentioned with staffing, we know we need to be more efficient. That's part of why we're looking at the data, trying to determine how to best distribute the limited resources of officers that we have and try to do it in a manner that's gonna keep the community safe. Now, the officers come to work 
every day here with the primary purpose and mission to keep people safe. There's a lot of connections to this community that officers personally have, and they very much value the safety of the community and come here with a concerted effort to do so on a, on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question will come from Linda Laskowski. Yeah, I had no problem finding the uh, transparency site. So thank you for making it easy. I do have a problem using it. So I did the obvious thing, which was to go to the search bar. And first I put in catalytic converters and I got a message back, let's expand your search, no results here yet. Then I tried district six and I got the same message. So uh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, th thank you, first of all, for, for going to the transparency hub and, and giving it a try. Um, that search tool isn't particularly useful as you found, but um, you can find those uh, data sets and uh, the visualization of that data uh, for uh, catalytic converters under current trends. So you might have a, a more tab um, at the very right of the, the list of tabs at the top of the page. Um, I do. Under that, it'll say current trends. So you can click on that. Um, and then there will be a number of little blurbs about uh, different crime specific problems that we've had questions on. And one of those will be catalytic converter thefts. And there'll be uh, a graph and a map where you can dig a little bit deeper. Okay. And how about information by district? So on every data page, uh, stops, calls for services, of course, crimes, and on those current trends pages. Um, <clears throat> On the, the bigger dashboards, like on the second level um, of the of those first four and on that same catalytic converter map, if you click on in the, an icon in the top right of the map, and this, let's see if I can explain this um, over, over Zoom here. There's a, a stack of squares. And when you click on that stack of squares icon, that'll give you a list of layers. And if you click on council districts, you'll uncover or you'll reveal the layer of council districts on top of the map. And then at that point, you can select a district using the selects tool uh, at the top left of the map. And if it's easier, I'm, I'm happy to share screen. And, and oh, I'm doing it as you're describing it. Thank you. Okay. That, so yeah, let me know if that's uh, causing any issues. But once you select a district, then that should filter all of the uh, charts and numbers to the, the data that you're looking at from that district. Got it, thank you. Yep. Okay, the next uh, question will come from Kim Van. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I have two questions. A little bit of an echo. Yeah, how do I get rid of that? You have a phone on or something else on? I have. Yeah, let me shut this off. Oh, we lost her. All right, we're, you can come back if you want. <laughs> um, but for now, we're going to go. The, the next question will come from Fran Hasselsteiner. Hello, thanks for taking my question. I actually have two questions, and I don't know if the officers can answer them. This is more, I'd like to know when the city council is going to stop hindering the BPD, such as not allowing them to uh, make traffic stops. That's been a real important enforcement measure here in Berkeley. And second, I'd like to know how council is going to make the city more attractive and less hostile to the BPD and recruiting. Thanks. Well, I think that question was directed to me. Fran, yes. Fran I'd love to have this discussion with you offline. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of things that some of us are trying to do to support our police department. And um, uh, I'd love to have a, a further discussion with you offline, if that's I'd possible. Like that. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. that. I may bring in a couple of other people of like mind. Great. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you, Fran. Thank you so much. Okay, the next uh, question is coming from Paula Reeves. Good evening, council member and officers. Can you hear me? Yes. Can. I'm joining you from Seattle this evening, and I'm so pleased to have my son at Berkeley. Uh, I am uh, concerned a little bit about some of the things um, that I've been seeing and reading, and I do appreciate the data you shared uh, and your mention of site design, uh, Sergeant. Um, I, I'm curious to know if you have data on any of the information about how people are, how many of these incidents and crimes are occurring from those coming into the area or in, you know, not immediately in the area. So they're coming in possibly by vehicle and I would really enjoy talking with your uh, traffic engineers, um, maybe about circulation and how that's working. And uh, curious to know if you're if you're working together with your traffic folks to, you know, alter and shake up the traffic flow a little bit so it's not so predictable that. Uh, you know, getting out of the areas, getting in and out of the areas so easy, getting in and around the, the dorms are so easy. Uh, our kids are sort of accessible. And then there's in and out uh, measures. And then, you know, I spent some time on Telegraph and I saw a lot of opportunity for site design and, you know, even pedestrian oriented corridors that uh, limit access by vehicle uh, could make your job somewhat easier, I think, in collaboration with your planners and your traffic engineers to, you know, find ways to use land use solutions that can uh, potentially um, sort of take these problems out by the root, so to speak, as opposed to kind of the reactive um, measures that we're talking about tonight. And and I totally do understand and appreciate the challenges you're dealing with. And I especially enjoyed the data you shared and hope to see more of that. Um, and thank you so much for uh, allowing me to have a comment. Sure, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, so part of the data we do collect, um, it's called RIPA data. So what that does is we collect information on every uh, contact basically that we have. And one of the questions that we added into our own internal data is where people are in or are actually from Berkeley or from another city in, Ber in Alameda County or they're outside of the county. Um, and when we arrest people, like at the culmination of these investigations, whether it's a patrol response or an investigation response, we do collect their data on where they live, like their current residence, and we have that information. And um, I don't know that we've done a super deep dive on how many of those are from outside of the city. Just contextually, we do have a number of folks committing crimes that are not from the city of Berkeley. Um, so I think to, to your point that that is a real thing, uh, absolutely. and. Regarding the working with traffic engineers, um, that may be happening at some level, but I don't know that we've actually looked at it from the lens that you're talking about, right? The ease of coming in and out of the city. Um, I do know that there is a discussion about um, making pedestrian only streets. Um, I'm not personally involved or, or super aware of where that process is. Um, but I do think the ingress egress of vehicles into the city is, is an interesting perspective and maybe something that we look into more in the future. Um, I hope that answered your question. Great. 
Okay, I'm going to go back to Kim Van, who you got dropped off earlier. Yes. Hi. Hi. My first Zoom. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Technology. Um, I have two questions to ask you guys. Um, does Berkeley PD have a volunteer police? patrol so to answer your question we we have a reserve program uh, but we do not have a volunteer police patrol uh, so reserves are a little different because they're they are they have taken some steps of law enforcement training and there's different levels and requirements uh, but we do not have a reserve or i'm sorry a volunteer patrol force would you be interested in something like that i think it's worth a conversation absolutely Okay, cool. Parent patrol, maybe, you know, something just around Berkeley, you see. Um, another question I had was, um, Berkeley just received a large amount of fundraising money, and we parents would love to see that put towards security. Do you have a wish list that you wish, like Berkeley would install a bunch of cameras or, or something that would make your job easier in regards to the campus? Yeah, uh, I would say first and foremost we would look to get our numbers up to where where we would like them our staffing is our number one priority and there is technology available that does assist in making whether it's prevent potentially preventing crime um, as in we get alerted that certain vehicles that are associated with other crimes are in the area um, that allows us to direct some limited resources to hopefully prevent an additional crime from happening um, or uh, but it gives us the ability to share information quicker with other agencies because like the lieutenant spoke to, um, these things are not happening in the vacuum of Berkeley. They're right. happening in the region, in the county. Um, so right. do you do you share information with the the Berkeley, the Cal Berkeley police? We do. So is there something that they need to be looking out for? They kind of take it they're they're kind of the police that cover the grounds and you guys cover the the outside of the grounds is that kind of how it works yeah so the jurisdiction of the of the uc police is the campus uh dorms or any uc properties uh within the area like they actually go all the way out to richmond for some uc property that they're responsible for out there um but yeah they they have access to our radio channels. Um, we have access to theirs. So if something happens pretty quickly or happens that is a high priority, a life safety thing, we share it with them. They hear it, we hear it. Um, so at a kind of a little bit of a faster pace, if something is, you know, let's say we have a robbery or something like that, they know about it rather quickly and they share it with us. Okay. Okay. Well, um, is there, who do we speak to about a, I'm a volunteer police patrol. Who would I contact? Guess that would probably be me. Um, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think I'm not sure how to share email or information, but if you go to the transparency hub, it has uh, our, it talks about community liaisons. So all my information is there. It has my desk line. It has my email address. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, before I go to the next person, I want to remind people if you put something, if you type something in the Q&A, we're not taking those uh, questions. So please raise your hand and we will get your question verbally. The next question is coming from Matthew Williams. Hello, can people hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I, I kind of have, uh, a comment and a question. And the first comment is that we're having a really serious problem all over Berkeley with uh, drivers who are failing to stop for pedestrians and crosswalks. And what we need are for the uh, the Hawk beacons to be activated. We need um, uh, uh, stricter fines and penalties for people who fail to stop for pedestrians. And um, it's a really serious problem. Uh, for those of us who walk. Um, and I, we just, we need that. The second thing is you mentioned that we should call if we see things, if we see crimes being committed, if we see things we think are suspicious. Well, uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in the uh, 
Pacific Steel casting buildings uh, on second between Chameleon and Page. And uh, a couple months back, I saw people climbing through the fence and flashlights inside the property. And the next day I found backpacks with burglary and metal theft tools uh, along the fence. And that evening the uh, thieves returned and they drove a uh, truck down the railroad tracks. I filmed them as they unloaded a bunch of stuff out of the building into the truck. I called the police and the officer who showed up, he said uh, that the incident was not a burglary. The building is abandoned. It's a squatting and homeless problem for the owner to solve. And he then said that I should stay out of the area and he demanded to know why I was there to begin with. I've lived in this neighborhood for almost 20 years. And he said I should mind my own business. And he implied that I shouldn't be bothering police with the goings on in that building. And he said, uh, don't go looking for snakes, you may get bit. That's a direct quote. So I just wanna know that whether I'm doing the right thing by calling to uh, uh, report things like that, um, it certainly felt like I was doing the wrong thing by calling him and uh, how I should proceed with uh, problems like that in the future. Um, that's my question, I yield back. Yeah, Matthew, thank you for that. You absolutely did, absolutely did the right thing, giving us a call. Um, I don't know the circumstances of that particular call, but you did the right thing by giving us a call, so please continue to call. Um, and in regards to uh, vehicles not stopping for pedestrians, uh, that is a focus of our uh, traffic bureau. Uh, we have limited motorcycle officers right now, right now focused on traffic, uh, but that is a, a dangerous driving maneuver. And that is a focus of, of our department. Um, that is something that we want to be proactive in stopping. Uh, and hopefully you know, we can be out there uh, as much as we can be out there. We're gonna try to stop people if, if we see that occurring. Okay, the next um, question that will come from Jesse Sheehan. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, good evening. Thank you for taking my question. Um, um, my question is, um, I, I have, I've been a victim of violent crime this year. Uh, I was attacked by a man um, with a, a shotgun who intended to use it. I, I later found out that assailant uh, committed suicide shortly after attacking me. Um, I reached out several times to my councilman in the district, Rigel Robinson, who um, really didn't help in any way or didn't respond to the victims. Um, we watched the, the crime around the People's Park Project um, escalate daily. And it seems like most of the crime attached or the criminals who are committing these crimes are part of some uh, social project done by Ari Newlight the university social worker that is bringing people into the area to get them housing. Um, I'm wondering um, how that is um, that the UCPD and the Berkeley PD can't coordinate uh, around People's Park better. Uh, they seem to just draw a line and uh, the UC kind of keeps the BPD from doing their job uh, simply by jurisdiction. Um, and with the increase in housing, 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 we see these talking points about housing um, and that we need this many housing units by this date. We would also need that many officers to police these housing units. Um, there's no outcry to immediately fix this through budget. I think these police department needs more funding and I think they need um, highly qualified candidates, which would mean more pay for the officers itself. I think it's imperative as we build housing to be sure that these housing projects are properly policed. Thank you. So to answer the first part of your question, um, in regards to the UCPD 
um, preventing us from doing our jobs. That's that's not the case. That's not what happens. We will try to work as collaboratively with them as possible. Um, as far as the rise in crimes uh, around People's Park, uh, again, if there are crimes occurring, please, you need to call us so we can address them as much as possible if they're in the park. Uh, that's the University Police Department's jurisdiction. Um, and as far as the coordination with the project on the, well, the housing project at People's Park, uh, that is a UC project. So there is some coordination with the city um, that doesn't always involve the police department. So as they're trying to do outreach and things like that, that's, that's a UC specific thing. And I do know that with folks around the park that uh, the city staff from the city also provide outreach up there and try to assist folks um, that are in need of help, in need of housing, in need of services, things like that. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna remind the attendees that um, we, we have a lot of hands raised actually, so please keep your questions to as brief as you can so we can get to everyone. Um, the next uh, question will come from Ernie Mansfield. Mute, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, you had mentioned uh, the city is authorized to hire 181 officers and you presently have 120 and you said something about it, but I'm just wondering, you know, that's 61 officers, that's a lot of officers and how can we hire these officers more rapidly? That's one question I have, and I guess I'll let you answer that. <laughs> please answer both. Please ask both questions. Okay. So the second part is um, there was some uh, uh, motion passed apparently in the city council a couple of years ago that there would be some other kind of staff, social work staff or some other kind of alternate uh, leasing. And what has happened with that? So to clarify, uh, we currently have about 150 officers. Uh, however, the, the 120, 129 number is out there as those who are able to work. There's officers who are on leave for various different reasons. Um, so that the able-bodied officer who's out there on the street is about 129-ish, uh, give or take the day. Uh, how we can get up there, I think I previously kind of alluded to it. Uh, we do have a, a recruiting team that ancillarily, it's an ancillary job for them. Um, years ago, when we faced a staffing crisis, we had a we were able to dedicate a full time sergeant uh, and uh, two officers to our recruiting team. We just don't have the staffing for that right now. So we've opened it up as an ancillary assignment. That team has gone to a number of recruiting events. Uh, outside in within the city and outside the city uh, to, look, to include the local Bay Area uh, over the last uh, approximately two months. Um, they're working on a very regular basis trying to get the word out. Uh, but it, like I said before, it's it's a matter of competition. You know, other local agencies are you know offering incentives that are different than our incentives. Uh, it's it's kind of a a challenge from jurisdiction to jurisdiction because everybody needs police officers. And so they're trying to not outdo each other, but they're just trying to be the, the most uh, the most attractive to that qualified officer. And right now the most valuable officer is the officer that's already trained, potentially has you know two to five years experience or more. That's what we classify as a lateral officer. And uh, there's agencies that are offering significant signing bonuses to come to those to, to their agency to their jurisdiction just recently there was a word that the city of alameda has a significant signing bonus for police officers uh, that is something that i've never seen before in my 15 years in the career so uh, that's that's what we're up against but uh, we're doing the best that we can and our team our recruiting team is out there and 
our officers are out there, whether you're on the recruiting team or not, it's a point of focus for the agency that we recruit and we try to, you know, get other people to come here to become police officers. So some of the, the best uh, spokespeople, you know, for this department are the people that currently work here. So there is an incentive for current officers to recruit other officers. Um, it's just a, a matter of time. These are kind of recent uh, incentives. And I just don't think there's been enough time to really see what their effect is. But like I said, while we uh, have new incentives, other agencies are having newer incentives, if you will. Hopefully that answered both of the questions there. Thank you. The next uh, question will come from former council member Cheryl Davila. Welcome, Cheryl. Welcome. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of things. One, um, I didn't hear a definition of a priority call. So I was curious if you could go over that. I'm just gonna go through my list. And then you did not speak at all about the racial disparities and how that's uh, in stops and how that's gonna be prevented in the future. And the Alameda County DA is a much needed change um, and she's doing a excellent job. Uh, we just had at the Equity Summit, just had an event the other night where she came and spoke about what she's doing and the changes that needed to be made and how there were a lot of racial, racist, uh, discriminatory practices, which she is, of course, as a black woman cannot condone or continue. So um, I just wanted to say that in Cheryl, behalf of- what is, can, you, can you address the question? Can you repeat? Yeah, I will. Okay. And then I, I already asked a couple, but then I was um, also wondering how do you prevent, if you're asking the community to start policing, which is, you know, could be problematic um, because there's people that, you know, uh, quote unquote, Karen type calls. Um, so how do you prevent that in a, in a racist, um, how do you prevent racism from happening within the, the police department as a whole, stops and otherwise? Thank you. And so it's continuing to train. Um, we have training that all officers go through. Uh, and we have training that our dispatchers go through for the, the calls that you mentioned. Um, and to answer your first question, the priority call, a priority call is something that's classified as occurring in the moment that uh, is a weapon in is involved or there's safety risk to some a victim or suspect that there is a priority emergency so it rises to the level of a priority one call uh, shootings uh, robberies uh, anything like i said anything involving a weapon whether it be a firearm or another sort of weapon there's some of the descriptions of priority one calls and priority calls okay Great. Um, I just want to let people know that we're, we're going to call on the people who have not had a chance to have their question answered. Um, so the next person, I believe, yeah, I don't believe we've got a question from Joshua Bushwell Charkow. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, did you ask a question already or not? I haven't, no, I Great. haven't, so thank you. Um, first, uh, Council Member uh, Weingraf, I wanna, I wanna thank you uh, for, for putting this event on. Um, public safety is, is, uh, is a big priority for me. Um, I, a couple of years ago, um, my kids and I were at San Pablo Park 
um, when there was a drive-by shooting and I've uh, almost been uh, carjacked um, two times. And um, I had two questions. One is if you, if you do have a working group that's working to get the council to address this more, I, I very much like to be a part of that. But my other request is I just get so frustrated that, you know, we hear all of these crime reports <laughs> like every month. And then I look at the council agenda and, you know, we'll have police that will occasionally come and, and do a report as happened recently, but there will be like stretches on end where there's no update. And I agree with so many of the callers, like this is just a crisis. It's just such an abomination that this is happening in our community. And I guess I'm wondering if you see any appetite for a standing item at the council agendas to update the community and just to keep this front and center and to start taking some proactive measures to get the crime under control. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Well, I think that um, our new website, the Transparency Hub, is an effort to keep you, to keep all of the residents of Berkeley updated uh, with information. And this is a new initiative that we didn't have before. So I urge you to go there frequently, go to the site frequently, and, and check out what's happening. Um, in, is there an appetite to keep this front and center? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are trying our best to do everything we can to recruit more police officers in Berkeley. That as Lieutenant McGee said, it's a very competi competitive environment. And um, when, when, when our police officers introduced you, themselves to you this evening, you saw what the education level of our police officers are. I mean, we have highly, highly educated police officers. Other jurisdictions don't have that kind of requirement. And so we, we want excellent police officers. We want officers who are sensitive to our community values. And that means that um, we're not going to pick everybody who wants to work here. So that, I mean, that I'm getting a little bit off track, but there are several of us on the council who want to keep this issue front and center. There are several of us who feel that public safety is our, it should be our number one priority. And there are several of us who are very interested in giving our police officers the tools that they need to do their work in the pos best possible way, whether it be technology or 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 something else, but um, we are we are working on it. Um, and, and you have my word, you have my personal commitment to continue to do that. Thank you. All right. The next question will come from Sasha Cortad or Cortade. All right, Sasha, I'm gonna go to the next person if you, okay. yeah, I'll, and I'll try you again later. So the next question will come from Elizabeth Arieza. Elizabeth, you you have to um, unmute. Can you can you push your um, this little button at the lower left hand of your screen with a microphone, a little icon that looks like a microphone. If you push that, you will unmute yourself. Okay, I am going to go back. Um, actually, no. I'm gonna, the next person to speak is going to be, or to ask a question is Emily Raguso. 
Hi, thank you all for uh, being here, having this meeting. This is Emily from the Berkeley Scanner. Um, one question I get a lot from community members that I'm sure many of you have also received, uh, particularly around this catalytic converter theft issue, uh, which we know is big in the district and elsewhere. Um, people often ask, you know, the police arrived, the, the suspect was still there, but the officers didn't chase them, you know, they didn't pursue them. So I'm hoping someone could sort of succinctly explain when under BPD's pursuit policy, what sort of calls are officers allowed to chase or pursue and when aren't they allowed? So what might explain the lack of pursuits around catalytic converter thefts? Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, so our, our pursuit policy, to really kind of narrow it down, we're only allowed to pursue for violent felonies. So think of robberies, shootings, homicides, things like that, um, in a very general sense. And as a result, a catalytic converter theft is at its core a property crime. So we do not pursue for that. We do not pursue for traffic violations. We do not pursue for burglaries. Um, the risk to public safety, if we were to engage in pursuits for those, would absolutely outweigh the public safety um, interest. Um, so in the last few weeks, we have pursued for uh, an armed robbery series um, that ended up in another city, but uh, we do ensure that each pursuit that is initiated fits within our guideline. Uh, the policy is actually V6. So if you go to the Berkeley PD website, um, it'll give you access to every general order that we have, um, and it will explain it more in detail, but the kind of very, very succinct version of it is serious violent felonies are the only times that we are gonna initiate a uh, vehicle pursuit. Great. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Arieza, I'm giving you another shot at unmuting and asking your question. So you have to unmute by clicking your microphone on the bottom of your computer, bottom left. All right, then we're gonna to go to the next person. Um, the next question will come from Roberto Reynoso. Yes, good evening to everyone. And thank you for uh, making this, this possible. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the officers. Uh, I really appreciate your efforts. Uh, I myself uh, wanted to become a police officer uh, due to physical limitations. I I opted to become a high school teacher. There are some parallels, but uh, uh, ultimately I have the utmost respect for you. Uh, my, my question uh, starts off with a comment. Uh, um, earlier, there was a lady that made reference to uh, possible uh, city council interference on police po policy. Um, and she was gracefully turned away and asked to have a private conversation at a at a later time, um, I believe that we should in fact have these conversations if politics are in fact influencing police work. Um, if it's hindering police work and ultim ultimately compromising the safety of the citizens of Berkeley, my daughter attends uh, UC Berkeley and I, I consider her a citizen of the city of Berkeley. Uh, she spends her money there, she pays rent there. Um, so I believe she is part of the city of Berkeley. So I believe that as a parent, as many of us are parents, I believe that we, we should have a voice in regards to this, uh, to this possible issue. If there is political interference with police work, then those conversations should be had so that we understand what politics and what the politics exactly are. Um, there was another reference 
to uh, the hiring process in regards to making sure that possible candidates uh, had the Berkeley values. Well, we would like to know what those values are. And we would like to know um, exactly what they are so that we understand whether or not that is the reason why it is so difficult to hire new officers. If I'm a teacher that is going to teach at a particular school and I find out that administration dictates how I'm gonna teach and if administration is going to hinder my teaching of my students, then I may not want to go to that particular high school. So- Excuse me, Mr. Reynoso, I'm going to interrupt you. Do you have a question? Yes. Because we well, have, but, we have yeah. many people, we only have seven minutes left and we have many people who are eager to ask questions. So if you could formulate your question, I would very much appreciate it. And also, if you could write to me, I'm happy to have a further discussion with you about the general topic of how does politics influence policing? I'm, I'm happy to my, do that. My, my question is geared towards uh, a possible approach to uh, helping police uh, around the, the UC Berkeley campus, which would be basically uh, increasing presence. Um, again, I'm not sure exactly how, um, how much, the police station or the city of, I'm um, sorry, the Berkeley police has um, and in regards how much liberty they have in regards to, to presence around the campus. Um, uh, I've done some research in regards to what universities such as USC is doing in regards to trying to uh, limit crime. So my question is, um, is there a possibility that just increased presence around the university may help uh, reduce crime? And has there been any thought given to this? Thank you. Yeah, first off, I just, just wanna say, I extend my thanks and appreciation for what you do uh, for your work. Uh, as a community, the teachers play a vital role in the health of the community. So thank you for what you do. And in terms of, uh, to succinctly answer, our officers patrol around the campus. It's part of our beats. Um, we patrol the South Campus area on a regular basis. Our bike team, um, which is down an officer because we have the officer had to go fill a patrol beat. Um, but our bike team gets to that area uh, as often as they can. They're in the downtown area. They do make their way up. Uh, to the South Campus area, but downtown, if, if you're, you know, your daughter's here, uh, she, I'm sure she's going to the downtown, uh, that, that's essentially around the campus as well. So our bike teams uh, try to focus on those areas, Telegraph, Shattuck, uh, where there's, you know, a lot of businesses, a lot of foot traffic, uh, in addition to the patrol officers. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Well, just because of time, we're gonna to have to stop the questions there. Um, Council member Wengraf will tell you how you can reach her as she um, makes closing comments for the evening. Well, thank you, Lori. Um, and thank you for all of you who have attended tonight. Uh, we have about 10 people who have not had an opportunity to ask their questions. My apologies to you um, for not getting to them. I urge you to write your questions to me at S-W-E-N-G-R-A-F as in Frank at cityofberkeley.info. That's my first initial and my last name, Swingraf at cityofberkeley.info. When I receive your um, questions, I will route them to the Berkeley Police Department and request that they respond. We also have five questions in the Q&A that we didn't get to, but I have a screenshot of those. So um, I'll be forwarding those to you. So let's just quickly talk, talk about takeaways from tonight's meeting. The first takeaway is, I think, 
that District 6 is very lucky. District 6 seems to have less crime than many other parts of the city. Um, we have a lot of catalytic converter thefts, but so do other parts of the city. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because I have heard from people that they think that more of that is going on in the hills than in other areas of the city. And, and uh, unfortunately that's, that's not true. Um, the second takeaway is if you are the victim of crime, please report it. The data that we have comes from the reporting. And the allocation of our resources is based on the data. So if, for example, your catalytic converter is stolen and we don't know about it, that's one less number that we have. We need to know if you're robbed, if your car is broken into, however minor the crime may be, it's very easy to report our crime online. And it, it just takes you know, a couple of minutes, but please take the time to do that because as the officers said, if, if they don't know about the crime, then we can't count it and we can't respond to it. So even if your neighbor reported their crime and it's similar to your crime, please take the time to report it. It's really important that we have accurate information about exactly what's going on. Um, just a couple of points and officers, please, if you think that, um, that I'm saying something that needs correcting, please step in and correct me. But I want to give people some tips on how they can, um, how they, uh, good things they can do to keep themselves safe. Because I think that people are worried. Um, so first of all, don't ever leave anything in your car of any value at all. There are people who are walking around at night with flashlights looking into your car. And if they see anything, they're going to break the window and grab it. Even if it's a bag of dirty socks and underwear. So please don't leave anything in your car. Don't even leave anything in your car if you're just parked on the street running in to pick up your dry cleaning. People are out there watching you leave your car. And if you leave your computer in your car and go into the dry cleaners, they're gonna seize that opportunity to smash your window and grab your computer back. This has happened to my family. So I, I know it, it happens. Um, if you have a garage, use it to park your car. If your car is in the garage, then people cannot take a flashlight and look in your window and see what you've got there. If somebody comes up to you and threatens you and asks you to give up your computer, your cell phone, or your wallet, do it. Don't be a hero. Your life is more important than your property. Um, so, the other thing is, is if you witness, and we've had this happen in District 6, if you witness a catalytic converter theft in progress, call the police immediately and tell the dispatcher, crime in progress. Don't go out to your porch and start screaming at the guy who's trying to steal your catalytic converter. We had a situation where somebody did that. They pulled out a gun and started firing. Okay. People have guns. You can assume that anybody who's committing a crime today has a gun. So don't do anything provocative that might make that criminal fire a gun at you. Um, and, you know, just be aware of your surroundings. Everybody is so plugged in these days, you know, with ear ear buds, talking on the phone, texting while you're walking. Please be aware of your surroundings and trust your instincts. Um, that, that is what I've learned over the years. I, I lived in Manhattan, so I had to learn the hard way. Uh, but 
I think those those rules still hold true. And I'll, I'll turn to the offices to see whether they want to make any additions or corrections to anything I've said. No, I think you've, you've ac accurately summarized a lot of the, the points that we talk about on our public safety statements. Okay. So again, thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant McGee, Sergeant Kleppy, and uh, strategic analyst Arlo Malmberg. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to all the community members who came out to listen. I hope that you learned something um, in my my best wishes for your safety. We are, I am working very hard to, to try to ensure that, that we keep you as safe as possible. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good night.